this is um, a paper, it's a macro paper, but very different than what we have seen so far. This is about monetary policy. And it's a question about what happens to exchange rates and uncovered interest rate differentials when there's a monetary policy shock. So maybe as a motivation, think about this. Um, many central banks around the world have been stuck at the zero lower bound, so the normal interest rate has been zero for a long period of time. Maybe the European Central Bank is an example. They have not just been stuck at zero, they have been stuck at um, negative rates. And so the question is now when you talk to them and say, oh, maybe you don't like it that you don't have any policy space because you cannot lower the normal interest rate below zero, why don't you just normalize and go back to a more normal situation? Well, that's what normalizing means slowly but surely bring the interest rate up to, to 3%, maybe 4% the normal interest rate. The typical intuition policymakers have about this is to say, oh, when there is a monetary tightening, then my currency is going to appreciate, and then they have a theory about why a currency appreciation is bad for them. So that would be the typical answer, and that type of answer comes from an intuition and from many empirical studies about temporary monetary policy shocks. Whereas in our view that if you were to normalize, it would not be a temporary increase in normal interest rates, but it would be a, a permanent one. So this paper is about, it's an empirical paper, and it's about this question, what happens when um, the policymaker increases the policy rate permanently as opposed to temporarily. So, that's what we're interested in. So as a comment on the existing literature, most there are many different ways to identify monetary policy shocks, but typically the, what people think about is always a temporary monetary policy shock. So there's a temporary tightening or a temporary easing. Mm, our point is that maybe there are temporary monetary policy shocks, but they're also permanent ones. You know, there were much higher inflation rates in the 70s and now and they've got much higher normal interest rates. And then there's, this is sort of, this paper is a follow-up or very related to a solo paper by Martin Uribe. Oh, I should have said that at the beginning. This is joint work between Martin and myself. And he has shown that um, he has looked at the importance of permanent monetary policy shock in the United States. And what he has shown is that actually these permanent monetary policy shocks that he identifies are very important in explaining changes in US output, US inflation, and the normal interest rate. In fact, he claims that the single most important factor in understanding changes in US inflation are these permanent monetary policy shocks. So motivated by this, we are looking in this paper at of what do these permanent monetary policy shocks do for exchange rates? And we talk also a little bit about um, uncovered interest rate differentials. As I said, this is gonna be a purely um, empirical paper. So I don't have to address questions at this point of saying, oh, you see a tightening of the monetary policy rate is this what people expect to last for a long period of time? Suppose you are a little bit familiar with the monetary history of Japan. Japan had a zero normal interest rate since 1995, so for 25 years now. But there were in the middle a bunch of episodes where the Central Bank of Japan started raising interest rates and then they always abandoned this and went back to zero. But in this kind of scenarios, you do have to think about oh, what were people thinking? Is it permanent or temporary? And we, we are not having a model here, we are, or a structural model, we are just having an empirical analysis of this case. So what do we find? We find that there's sort of a big difference in the sign of the impulse responses for transitory or permanent um, monetary tightening. So if you have a permanent monetary tightening, then the normal exchange rate depreciates. Um, maybe you think, oh, this is obvious. If you have a tightening sooner or later, you're going to have also higher inflation. So you should obviously have a depreciation in the long run. So we say now you are, that's why we give the modification here. We say the normal exchange rate depreciates not only in the long run, 
to be true, but already in the short run. So this is sort of the counterpart to the result of Uribe in the closed economy who shows that if you have a permanent monetary tightening, then inflation increases right away, which is opposite of the conventional wisdom that if you tighten, inflation falls. And the second result for permanent shocks is that, that they cause deviations from uncovered interest rate parity against the high interest rate currency. So if you hold the high interest rate currency as a carry trader, and the monetary policy shock is permanent, you would make a loss. At the same time, we find consistent with an enormous literature on temporary shocks that that, non -exchange, that the non-exchange rate appreciates when you have a temporary monetary policy shock. Um, we don't get an overshooting effect, but I think that's secondary. And then we also, consistent with existing literature, we find that a temporary monetary tightening causes deviations from uncovered interest rate parity in favor of the high interest rate currency. That is to say, there are returns to the carry trade conditional on um, temporary monetary policy shocks. So the results that we obtain for temporary monetary policy shocks are in line with the large existing literature. So what is new in this paper is to talk about what happens in response to permanent monetary policy shocks. And also a new finding is that um, permanent monetary policy shocks explain a large fraction of exchange rate movements, as I'll show. They, they explain about half of the volatility per cost error variance of exchange rate at a horizon of maybe one, two, three, or four years. Okay, so this is a purely empirical model. Um, and we want to say something about the behavior of these five variables. So we want to know what happens to US output, inflation in the United States, the normal interest rate in the United States, or the federal funds rate. The epsilon is the depreciation rate, so that the exchange rate itself is dollars per unit of foreign currency. So if the level of the exchange rate goes up, that's a depreciation, or if Epsilon, which is the devaluation rate, goes up as a depreciation also. If epsilon is negative, it's an appreciation of the currency. And the fifth variable we want to say something about is the foreign normal interest rate. I'll just show one example here in this talk, which I will look at um, the pair in the United States and the UK. So I star would be the bank rate um, of, of the Bank of England. Epsilon would be the dollar pound exchange rate, the rate of change in that variable. I would be the federal funds rate. Pi is US inflation and Y is US output. So we want to know something about permanent monetary policy shock. And the way we model this is to say we have a bunch of latent variables that are stationary. These are these variables that have hats on top of them. Y hat pi hat, i hat, epsilon hat, and i star hat. So these are all non-observed and stationary. And so what we are saying is that output, the stationary variable y hat, is the deviation of output from its permanent component. So here this looks just okay. They make, we assume there's a permanent component x, but we are putting in here that the result of long run neutrality. So we don't have any monetary permanent component in, in this expression here. So what makes output stationary is just a permanent component of real output. In many, say, RBC models, X would be the permanent TFP shock. Inflation itself is non stationary, but the, it has a permanent component, which is the whole topic of this paper, which is this XMT which is the permanent component of the US monetary policy. And, and so what is stationary is the deviation of actual inflation from its permanent component. In the third line, we have the normal interest rate. And so we want to impose that the Fisher effect holds in the long run. How do we impose that? We say that the normal interest rate is also co-integrated with this permanent component. That is to say that the difference between the normal interest rate and inflation is something stationary. And so we know if you try to approximate the long run with long time averages, 
we know that the difference between the normal interest rate i and pi, say in the cross section of many countries, is um, not much affected by, by whether the country is a high inflation or low inflation country. So here, this assumption that they are both co-integrated with this permanent component is just a reflection of the fact that I think is very little controversial that in the long run, the Fisher effect holds. When we want to talk about exchange rates, we, we make, we think a very weak assumption. We say that the, the real depreciation rate is stationary. And so then this leads to, to this expression of the level of the depreciation rate minus the difference in the permanent trends between US monetary policy and UK monetary policy is stationary. And so then this year is for the UK. So this paper is about trying to estimate this XM. Maybe your first reaction is going to be, okay, why are they making this so complicated? Well, once you see what I do, um, everybody knows how to do run a Blanchard qua um, regression, and it takes two seconds, and we can um, ask with a Blanchard qua type regression, what is the effect of a permanent monetary policy shock? So in our case, it will be what's the effect of XM. And we, we want to argue that if you do that, yes, you can do that. But if you have this SVR um, representation of such a model, then you are very much tied in and you, for example, which is one thing that we want to have and we cannot have if we were to go to a Euro Blanchard thing, we don't want that the permanent monetary policy shock has a real effect in the long run. So we want to preserve monetary non-neutrality, monetary neutrality, sorry, in the long run. And, and you can't do that if you just do a VAR and a Blanchard quad. So this is why we go for a structural model that we then want to estimate with a Kalman filter. What we are doing is we postulate that these latent variables, um, they do have a v an outer regressive structure. And then we put here the five shocks we are interested in. So the change in the permanent component of US monetary policy, XM, which is I said what the paper is mainly about, ZM, which is the conventional temporary monetary policy shock, X, which is to say permanent real shock, a TFP shock, Z, a transitory real shock, and then <coughs> delta XM star, which is the, the the permanent component of UK monetary policy. And we also want to allow for some persistence in these shocks. This is also something you couldn't do if you were to do a regular VR analysis. So we have, all of them are orthogonal to each other. So row is diagonal and the matrix psi is diagonal. And what the purpose of the exercise is, is to estimate these matrices B, C, rho, and psi. Mm. Okay. This, I said these are all latent, so what are the things that we do see? We claim we can easily observe the growth rate of real output. We can observe the difference between interest rates and inflation. We can observe the growth rate of the normal interest rate, the rate of change in the depreciation rate, and the rate of change in the policy rate of the Bank of England or in the foreign normal interest rate. So then when we have a structure and we have five observables, we can just use the common filter to estimate the system. Let me make a comment on what are our identifying assumptions. We have a bunch of permanent shocks that allows, that helps with identification. So we have a permanent real shock X. So output is co-integrated with that. We have this permanent domestic monetary shocks and domestic inflation and the domestic loan interest rate is co-integrated with that. And then we have the permanent foreign monetary policy shock. On top of that, we, we tried to identify, or well, that's how we identify it, the transitory monetary shock by um, having some prior restriction on the impact effect, where we just say on impact, Christian and Eichenbaum is very well known, said, a monetary policy shock is a shock that on impact does not move inflation or output. That would be a straight zero. We are saying we're a little bit looser. We are saying a monetary policy shock is a shock that increases the normal interest rate on impact 
but um, has to either have no effect on output and inflation or it has to lower output and inflation. So these are our identifying assumptions. Um, we, we, we do this also using the real exchange rate, not just the normal exchange rate. When we do that, we replace the observation of, of the normal exchange rate with the real, which is just the level of the nominal times the foreign price level divided by the domestic price level. And we also change the observable from the depreciation rate, the change in the depreciation rate to, to the depreciation rate, the real depreciation rate. Um, Okay, and then what we want to know, we want to answer two questions with this estimation. We want to ask what are the observed effects of the permanent monetary policy shock? So are all the central bankers who are extremely concerned that a tightening of monetary policy in the sense of raising the normal interest rate, not just for one or two years, but sort of permanently, whether that will really appreciate their currency and therefore they are reluctant to do it, whether that is true. So that's one thing we are looking for. And the other thing we are looking for is how important are these permanent monetary policy shocks. Mm. <clears throat> Let me just say, what are we looking for? Without me being able to explain this very much to you, I just took an off-the-shelf new Keynesian model from Galia Monacelli, and I asked that model what would be the impulse responses to a permanent and to a temporary monetary policy shock. So on the variables that we are newly discussing here, I mean, not talking about inflation outputs, so if you go to the second row, you see if you have a monetary tightening, the federal funds rate is 1% higher on impact. In that particular model, we did actually a little bit of zigzag here, but what happens to the exchange rate, you get exactly what you got, say, in Don Bush 1979. On impact, there's an appreciation, and because uncovered interest rate parity holds in these models, there has to be subsequent depreciation, so that is the famous overshooting result of Don Bush, that also holds in these new Keynesian models, appreciation on impact, but not the long-run appreciation is a little bit lower, so you have this so-called overshooting. Many people have looked at the lower row. What we want to look at is at the upper row, and just before I show you the empirical results, that you don't think they are so outlandish, that actually what we find in the data is what is in any model, but people don't look at these permanent monetary policy shocks. So here, this shows you the impulse response when you have a shock that in the long run will increase inflation and the normal interest rate by 1%, and shows you that the way this comes about in such a model that has a specific monetary feedback rule is not by any easing, so it's, but actually is you tighten gradually until you reach one. What happens with the exchange rate, you don't get any appreciation. So if you were to talk to the Japanese central bank and told them, tighten, get out of the liquidity trap you've been in for 25 years, bring rates gradually back to normal, three or 4%, the, the intuition everyone has is no, no, it has to be an appreciation of the normal exchange rate. And here you get right away a depreciation. Intuitively, what's going on in the background here is that when you tighten and agents understand that it is permanent, then inflation increases immediately. So inflation rises instead of falls, and with it, then the exchange rate moves. Okay, so this is just what would happen in theory. As I said, this is not a paper about theory. This is about data. And this is what we find in the data. So let's start first with the second row, which is the conventional one that maybe you should recognize from the seminal paper of Eichenbaum or in Evans, so similar paper. So the experiment is there's a temporary monetary policy shock, so the federal funds rate increases by 1%. The shock is shortly lived after 24 months, it's basically back to zero. What do we find, like many other papers, um, we don't find overshooting, but we find a gradual appreciation. That's true for the normal exchange rate as well as for the real exchange rate. And as stressed in the financing part of that literature, you get a deviation of uncovered interest rate parity in favor of the high interest rate currency. So this is what carry traders explore. What is new here in the paper is the top row that shows you what happens if there's a shock which increases the normal interest rate in the long run by 1%. So it's estimated to be gradually approaching this 1%. And here's what we're interested in. 
Is it true that a tightening that is lasting leads to an appreciation or an immediate depreciation? So we say no. If you tighten and the tightening has the permanent aspect, then it depreciates the currency. So you don't have to be afraid of by normalizing monetary conditions once you have been stuck maybe at a value that is lower than you want to be. This estimate tells you at least for the US-UK pair, you get an immediate depreciation. The same for the real exchange rate. And with the immediate depreciation comes also that the carry trader would get caught. You know, the excess returns to the carry trade are negative or in the language of that literature, and the high interest rate currency is actually um, would make a loss investing in it. Um, Sorry, you have about four minutes left. Okay, so let me see what I'm gonna talk about for this. Yeah, that's fine. Mm. So one question is, we have this abstract thing, what is the permanent component of, of monetary policy and a shock to it. So we try to smooth it out from the Kalman filter. So in this picture, you have one super ziggy zaggy line, which is the inflation rate, this monthly inflation, US monthly inflation. And the blue line is the permanent component. And so when were there big swings in the permanent component of US inflation? So here's 1980. So this was the big Volcker disinflation. Um, you see that the permanent component very quickly declined between 1980 and 1984. Some further declines from 1990 to 2000. And then I think this is sort of interesting is that our estimation basically says that the permanent component of US inflation stayed pretty much stable between around two to 3% throughout the Great Recession. Here, this, this little part is the Great Recession until maybe 2012. 2012, the US has been four years um, with a zero normal interest rate. The recession was over in 2009. And you see that is the moment, 2012, when the US kept, kept interest rates at zero. This is when you see the permanent component coming down, 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 down. Here's the inflection point of the permanent component of inflation which is exactly the moment in December 2015 when the US tightened, so tightened again. So this is the permanent component we get out of there. Mm, we think it looks very reasonable. If you had done an HP filter, you get like some of the work of Pablo Nicolini looks very similar, of course. He just does an HP filter and so he can't look at these impulse responses. Then the last claim we had made is that are these permanent monetary policy shocks important? So we find that they're really important for inflation and this is the last result I want to advertise <coughs> for the level of the normal exchange rate, the domestic permanent monetary policy shock and the foreign permanent monetary policy have jointly explained almost half of all the 12 months ahead forecast error variances of the dollar pound exchange rate. So this is for this variable, a very important shock. Okay, since I ran out of time, let me quickly um, conclude. So the innovation in our paper is to allow for this permanent um, monetary policy shock and try to estimate them. And at the same time, estimate transitory monetary policy shocks. And what we find is that they have, those two type of shocks have exactly the opposite sign in their responses. So transitory tightening cause an appreciation of the exchange rate, whereas permanent tightenings cause a depreciation. Transitory tightenings cause deviations from uncovered interest rate parity in favor of domestic assets, whereas permanent tightenings cause deviations in favor of foreign assets. And overall, permanent monetary shocks explain um, about half of all the short run movements in normal exchange rates. Thank you. Oh, I'm not an expert, but I uh, in this area, but I learned a lot uh, from reading and preparing uh, this discussion. So exchange rate is um, a very interesting pheno uh, variable to exam. So there are a large uh, number of empirical studies to uh, analyze the st uh, characteristics of exchange rate dynamics. So. Many papers study this uh, overshooting phenomenon that is based on the seminal work by Don Bush. So if there is um, 
all these assumptions in Dobush um, paper uh, holds, then an expansionary multipolar shock will cause a larger short run depreciation than how much the uh, exchange rate depreciate in the long run. So, so people have found uh, the, some mixed evidence on overshooting on impact or with a delay. And uh, the challenge is to identify that monetary policy shocks. The existing papers usually just assume there's a one type of monetary policy shock. And the, uh, so that's uh, one question that this paper tries to address. And the another, uh, another uh, equally uh, interesting and important uh, phenomenon for uh, exchange rate is this uncovered interest parity, which was taken as um, uh, an assumption in Don Bush paper. So, but uh, in the data, people find that there is uncovered interest rate parity puzzle. Interest rate differentials actually is not a good forecaster on exchange rate. So if a country tightens its monetary policy, increased interest rate, actually you can have excess return by holding that domestic assets that is the, uh, in the short run. That's the source of carry trade. So this paper uh, introduced two types of monetary policy shocks, permanent and the transitory. They uh, extend, Martin and uh, Stephanie and Martin, they extend uh, um, Martin's paper uh, into this open economy uh, version. So the, in this empirical model, they have the five observables, like uh, Stephanie said, and importantly, they have this uh, five structural shocks, including permanent and the transitory monetary uh, shocks, uh, as well as a permanent and the transitory non-monetary policy shock. Um, so they use the basic estimation to estimate this uh, model in state space form. And the important identification assumptions are based on some alcohol uh, integration assumptions and the sign restrictions for the transitory uh, monetary policy shock. So uh, I'll just uh, quickly summarize the main findings. They use, uh, they estimate this uh, empirical model uh, based on the data for US and UK pair, as well as US Japan pair using the monthly data from 1974 to 2018. They find that first, uh, to answer the, the first on Don Bush uh, overshooting um, results, they find actually there's no exchange rate uh, overshooting in response to both temporary shocks and the permanent multi policy shock. And the second they find that regarding the UIP um, puzzle, there is, um, they support this um, kind of positive uh, UIP uh, deviation in favor of uh, domestic asset if the multi policy shock is transitory, but the permanent multi policy shock uh, generates the opposite result. And well, that is really interesting and important, especially that they show the permanent multiple shock can explain a large fraction of the movements in the exchange rates. So I just want to show you two pictures to uh, kind of illustrate these uh, results. One is on this uh, overshooting like Stephanie show, right? If we look at the impulse response of the nominal exchange rate uh, to permanent, uh, U.S. interest shock, as opposed to the transitory U.S. interest shock, we can find that this um, permanent shock generate immediate and persistent depreciation of the nominal exchange rate uh, for the shock for this permanent shock that generate one percent deviation, uh, one percent increase in the domestic interest rate, and we get the opposite result on this persistent appreciation of the nominal uh, exchange rate, but either way, we don't find overshooting. So, they, um, so Stephanie and Martin argue that the reason why we have some empirical findings in the literature regarding the overshooting results, it could be the confounding effects of um, combining these, uh, of you assuming only one type of shocks, but actually uh, both uh, transitory shocks and the permanent shocks are there. Um, and regarding the UIP deviations, so, um, so looking at this transitory uh, monetary policy shock, we do find this uh, support for you know, doing carry trade, uh, the, temporary transitor, uh, temp, uh, the temporary monetary policy shock will cause the short run UIP deviation in favor of the domestic asset, but for the permanent US monetary policy shock, we see the opposite. And these are short run phenomena, UIP holds in the long run, as we know it from the literature. 
So my first comment is regarding uh, this uh, setup for the empirical paper. Um, so in this uh, empirical model, they assume that there are permanent and transitory domestic monetary shock um, and also non-monetary uh, shock, but they only uh, kind of put in one permanent uh, foreign monetary shock. So there, they don't uh, allow for a transitory foreign monetary shock. Um, I wonder whether that kind of, uh, can uh, somehow influence the estimate. Based on the estimation result, for example, uh, looking at the US-UK pair, um, yeah, so it's true that for the two permanent monetary policy shocks combined together, if you look at the long horizon at uh, forecasting horizon of 36 months, um, they can explain a majority amount of the variation in the nominal um, exchange rate, but it looks like, okay, look at the, this UK and the US the, uh, pair, the foreign, money, uh, foreign uh, permanent monetary policy shock has a larger fraction. And it's also interesting to think about the Japan, US-Japan pair, where we think, uh, well, what is the size of which shock is more important in driving um, uh, UK, uh, the, the dollar yen exchange rate, given what, is happen what has happened for the US monetary policy shock, it is kind of interesting to see why this uh, foreign permanent shock for Japan does not have a large, uh, 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 does not account for a large share of the variation. So I, I think it may be interesting and useful to incorporate foreign inflation and the foreign transitory shocks into the system. And, uh, and also it will be interesting to then look at how the exchange rate dynamics look like. Um, so I think that is, uh, for example, in this paper by uh, the uh, Michalis and uh, Ecoviello, where they look at the permanent uh, foreign interest rate of permanent foreign monetary policy shocks in the case of Japan. And second is how to interpret the estimated shocks. Um, so as we saw in Stephanie's um, talk here, they report uh, the estimate of the um, domestic permanent monetary policy shocks um, and compare that uh, against the inflation. So I think this is a, a really interesting um, and uh, um, so I think it's, as, as Stephanie explained, right, this, a lot of movements can, can, can be rationalized by what we learn on the monetary policy uh, regime for the U.S. But I think it will be nice to, you know, look, to look at other estimated shocks, for example, the transitory shock and uh, the foreign permanent, uh, the, the, the permanent foreign monetary policy shock. For the transitory shock, um, there, is, there has been a lot of studies to, to estimate the multi-policy shocks based on the high frequency movement of federal fund rates around the, the monetary policy announcement. So it will be interesting to, uh, kind of, uh, to put those uh, side by side. Another thing is if you look at the foreign, um, permanent foreign monetary policy shocks, I think you can compare that with, uh, especially for the, uh, the case of Japan, and also recently, uh, you know, I think this is a, uh, for the new data, if you want to ex uh, extend the analysis, given the recent um, the Fed uh, policy change, how they target uh, inflation to the average inflation, okay? Um, and my third comment is regarding the kind of the, the implementation. The paper has done, um, you know, very nice job in the estimation and they conduct some robustness check by uh, looking at, you know, uh, post vocal uh, error and during the vocal area. Um, I, I wonder whether, you know, maybe some other um, subsample or not, uh, some other estimation based on different subsample. So the previous figure I showed seems to suggest that there's some um, uh, more volatile movements in the permanent shock to the permanent monetary policy shock. So it will be interesting to see. And another thing is um, here the model, uh, uh, this paper, they estimate uh, this empirical model by using the US UK data and, sep uh, and separately and I regress uh, on the US Japan data. So I wonder whether it is be uh, use useful to estimate 
you know, a bigger model based on a panel of advanced countries. So the reason is, you know, so here we, uh, permanent, sh uh, permanent shocks are hard to estimate and, and identify. So if, um, so for example, I don't know how the estimated uh, shocks compare across these two regressions and it will maybe uh, uh, interesting to and useful to estimate a bigger model for a larger panel of data. So, Vivian, yes. you are almost out of time. Okay, but, so uh, I guess. But I don't know, I mean, if there are no, no questions it's... that pop in, or maybe you want to summarize. Oh, yeah. So, I, I think just uh, like a two point, uh, quick points, and I think for the measures, uh, we can talk about that uh, afterwards. Um, and the lastly is the challenge to rationalize this um, empirical findings if you want to uh, write down a theoretical uh, open economy new casing model. Um, I think there's um, the, the difficulty is that whether these such models can really generate different behaviors of foreign risk premium in the presence of permanent and transitory monetary policy shocks. But there is a lot of uh, usefulness in do, conducting such uh, theoretical work. So, yeah, sorry, uh, I will just uh, wrap up here. I think uh, this paper makes an important contribution to the studies of exchange rates. And uh, I, uh, but it also points out um, the area indeed, uh, this is the area that we need to do a lot. So we still, we know little about the exchange rates. Thank you. Okay, uh, so we have a few questions. Uh, Christina Arellano has one and then Valerie Remy. So Christina, go first. Yeah. Uh, so I enjoy very much the paper, uh, Stephanie. Uh, so I guess one thing that is in the back in the minds of central bankers when they're afraid of uh, appreciations is that uh, exports are going to fall. Uh, and so I know that you had not, uh, in, your, in your estimation, uh, you had not uh, included, I guess, exports or as, as one of the variables. And uh, But I was wondering if you thought about this both empirically and uh, theoretically in the context of these permanent monetary policy shocks. Okay, now Valerie. Uh, so I thought this was a really interesting paper. I was wondering about one thing, which is the some of the identifying assumptions and particularly uh, with respect to low frequency movements. So one of your identifying assumptions is that the real interest rate doesn't have a unit root, which is fine. But there's a lot of evidence of low frequency movements in the real interest rate. And there are quite a few papers now talking about how the natural rate of interest is negative. And I'm wondering how that would affect your results. And related to that are, is also the low frequency movement in unemployment. And I'm thinking about uh, Giorgio Primacheri's uh, 2005 RE stud paper that found that it was actually non-policy shocks that were leading to the uh, behavior of unemployment inflation in the 70s, the high unemployment and the high inflation. And, and one argument there is that policymakers get confused. And then, so it's actually a change in policy in response to these low frequency movements in variables that can't technically have unit roots, but where the low frequency uh, behavior can really uh, mess with long run restrictions. And we have one more by Sabnem. Uh, hi, okay, it's a very, very nice paper. Um, I also want to ask uh, something related. So do we think this paper in terms of like an advanced country uh, historical panorama paper, like do we think this as US and uh, you know, coming since 1970s with Volcker and then moving forward? I mean, if that's what we want to do, then, then I agree both with Vivian and, and Valerie that we really want to understand this, what is, what is this permanent thing? So Volcker is fine, but I guess the next permanent thing is, is the new thing that we are just going to go through the next four years. Now we are going to have a, a permanently low interest. So I, it's very hard for me. I, I see your picture, it's beautiful, the blue and common and everything, but it's very hard for me to associate those things with permanent changes, especially when in US monetary policy responds to domestic conditions, right? As opposed to an emerging market, if I want to think this in terms of an emerging market, then you know, monetary policy directly responds to external shocks and to exchange at volatility. And, uh, that, and that can be combined, that type of a transitory response can be combined with paradigm shifts uh, just because these are emerging markets and they are developing and all that. So, so in that sense, how, how, how do we think this? Uh, and my final thing is also, 
in this literature, again, going back to the advanced country literature, this literature, you know, this goes back to Dornbusch and Fama and all that and the whole empirical literature, it doesn't use expectation. UIP condition is a condition we write with expected exchange rates. And uh, we have to measure it with expected exchange rate. I mean, Jeff Frankel made this point very earlier and you know, it was uh, there at some point, but then the literature completely forget about it. But if you actually do use expect exchange rate, and in fact, now we are in this revolution in macro uh, in terms of inflation expectations, why not use the ex expected exchange rate? If you do use that, none of these patterns are there. There is no such thing as high interest rate currencies appreciate. You do get all the right uh, hum shape. You get all the right things in advanced countries once you use the expectation of the exchange rate. So, what do you think on that? I would like to get your thoughts on that. Thank you. Okay, uh, if we don't have more questions, so Stephanie, the floor is yours. All right. First of all, thank you very much, Vivian, for, for, for your many comments. And Vivian also had asked me for some data, and I'm sorry I couldn't produce all of it. So yeah, Vivian's first question was, why do you keep the model so small? You have five variables. Um, so I think she asked it in two ways. She says, First of all, why don't you also include foreign inflation, but more substantially, she said, you know, you, you are trying to characterize a U.S. temporary and permanent monetary policy shock. So it better be the case that you get the same version of that shock, whether you make the second country Japan or you make the second country the U.K. It shouldn't be true that the U.S. monetary policy shock changes depending on what you use as a variable, right? So the answer to this is, um, we, so we are revising the paper right now. So we have included maybe in a bunch of more variables of one or two. Um, so we can get better, better measures of the real exchange rate. But estimating a model with OLS and putting a Blanchard, Blanchard qua condition takes, I don't know, on my machine two seconds. And what I'm doing takes on my machine 24 hours. So or sometimes because, you know, with a Bayesian estimation, you have to first find the optimum is very slow. And so you have to think very hard before you press enter, what version of the model do you want to consider? But I agree with you, if I had a faster way how to do the Kalman filter to estimate that model, I would like to do exactly what you say, Vivian. I better want to get the same monetary policy shock across. But currently it goes beyond the bounds of our computational ability to do it in a reasonable amount of time. So we don't know how to do it. Um, okay, and then there was your second point was, what is this permanent component XM? And I think that Nem also said, please, I mean, I can see that you show me a graph and it looks sort of nice, but I want to have an interpretation. What is it? Um, so as I, I didn't have time to show you, but you can, Suppose, as I said, if you just go and try to get the permanent component in a very econometric way, say you take um, the HP filtered permanent component, you get, you get pictures that look very similar to what we identify as the permanent monetary policy shock. Um, and so then comes, I think, more philosophical question, what determines this permanent component of monetary policy? And so there, I would say we are very radical monetarists. I mean, I don't, I think in the long run, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. So I don't go with one of these things. Oh, yes, you know, like inflation is this thing that moves by itself and the poor central bank is trying to nudge it around so that the distortions in the economy are minimized. I think in the short run, yes, we have normal rigidities, we have other frictions in the economy. But in the long run, it is what the central bank is doing and you know if you want to have my comment maybe i'll be super wrong everybody can replay it how i was missing the point but what the fed just announced is basically going for zero normal interest rate for three or four years right unless you really really think that the new real interest rate in the united states is minus two which i don't know much about but suppose it was true Yes, then I can see that they can hit the inflation target of plus two. But if not, the only thing we're going to get from this is a massive undershooting for the next four years from the inflation target. So that is, I mean, also said, ma'am, my answer to that is we think why is the, we think this permanent component of monetary policy is something picked by the central bank. Why they don't keep it nice and solid. I, I don't have a good answer for that, but we don't think it is something fundamental in the economy moving. 
that that is moving this. We really, I mean, that's an interpretation. I guess. It's not something I test. It's more an interpretation. Mm. Okay, then um, Christina Arellano asked me, um, you say that central banks are, are worried about tightenings because they think it will appreciate the currency and they are not per se worried about appreciating the currency. They are worried about the, that really hurts their exports. Why don't you include exports? So first of all, I mean, when you have a permanent tightening, it depreciates the currency. So if you believe in that stuff, that there's really this bigger than ever, which I don't believe in, anyway, you would think it is great for your exports, right? Um, but again, why don't we exclude, include exports or more macro variables? It's just because we don't know how to tame this beast. This beast is very difficult to tame and to compute. Ideally, I would like to do it with 10 variables, but I don't know how to do it. Um, and then Valerie said something very true. You treat the real interest rate as not having a unit root, but definitely the real interest rate has very significant low frequency movements. How can you look at a graph of the real interest rate from 1982 now and not agree with this? Yes, Valerie, that's true. And so we're gonna to try to, we have been playing around with the version of the model where we try to um, allow some kind of drift also or, or some permanent movements in the real interest rate because yes, that is in the data and that's probably something one, one should address. 